Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, professor of history at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Every one of the nearly half million soldiers in the U.S. Army has a personal story. Since the introduction of the all-volunteer force in 1973, individual appeals have shaped the recruiting message. After spending decades encouraging recruits to be all you can be, the Army experimented with an army of one to emphasize the soldier's individual journey, though abandoned that slogan in favor of the more ambiguous Army Strong within a few years, before attempting again to appeal directly to the individual with the slogan, What's Your Warrior? The force has evolved as well, as those individual recruits have included more women in more roles, and the Army family has come to include a great many dual-career Army families, enriching yet complicating the lives of soldiers and the life of the force. Respecting individual experiences within an organization that naturally requires regimentation and uniformity remains challenging. Individual success stories and struggles, as well as scandals such as what has recently happened at Fort Hood, remind us how far the Army has come, but also how far it has yet to go in respecting the equal rights and dignity of all soldiers. Generalizing about the experiences of any soldier or of all soldiers in the Army is risky, but studying individual experiences nonetheless has value. So today, on A Better Peace, we welcome Lieutenant Colonel Ann Meredith of the U.S. Army War College Class of 2021, who is herself a member of a dual-career Army family, to discuss her experiences over the past two decades and her thoughts about the future. A native of Wisconsin, Lieutenant Colonel Meredith was commissioned as an MP officer with a BA in history from the University of Wisconsin in 1999. She has led at all levels with extensive experience supporting combat operations as an MP for the last 21 years, including commanding an MP company in combat in Afghanistan, and most recently as command of the 97th MP Battalion at Fort Riley, Kansas. She also was part of the reconstruction of the Iraqi police force in 2003-2004. She is married to an armor officer and fellow War College student and has two small children. So she has a lot to tell us, and we are delighted to have her with us today. Welcome to A Better Peace, Lieutenant Colonel Ann Meredith. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be here. So Ann, how did you find your way to the Army? So that, that's a really good question, Ron. Uh, I was a, um, I went to the, the University of Wisconsin, as you stated, mm-hmm. um, and there I was supposed to play softball. And so the ROTC courses, um, the, the counselor for our, you know, the student counselor said, hey, these courses in ROTC that are perfect timing f- to fit around practices. And basically there were some ROTC classes that all the athletes took. Um, mm-hmm. So I joined that. And then I broke both my arms um, and didn't play softball anymore, but I really enjoyed the courses. So I kept taking these ROTC courses for the next two years, even though I was not a cadet. Whoa. Um, it was just fun. I thought it was, you know, it, it was a break from history. You got to run around in the woods. It was, <laughs> it was interesting. Um, so I started taking the classes and then I decided that, oh, this is cool. I can, I can do this and I can get a, a scholarship for it and I enjoy it. Um, I was not a good cadet. Um, you know, the rest of them they had lived their whole lives to become army officers and I just kind of fell into it. So then I ended up getting commissioned into the army, um, at, and enjoyed it quite a bit. It, initially I had an educational delay. I was going to go to the university of Iowa for law school and about two weeks prior to going to the University of Iowa, I was called by HRC or Human Resources Command and told that they had underassessed MPs that year. And so um, we needed to report to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. 
in June or whatever it was. Wow. Uh, so I, I have stumbled my way into the army. None of it was intentional. And I will tell you, and I tell everybody this, I have been getting out of the army since the day I joined the army. And for <laughs> some reason I am still here because um, I really enjoy it. I enjoy soldiers. And you are still here and you are now at the army war college. Uh, mm-hmm. How, I, I, well, two questions. One is how did you end up uh, in uh, take choosing the MP uh, career path? But then um, how, how has it been moving from uh, positions overseas and positions in the States over the past 21 years? It's been great. So I, I chose the MP career path with no knowledge really of what it was. I thought I could be a dog handler. Um, and that's just the honest truth. Come to find out officers aren't dog handlers. And I figured that out right away. Um but so, so the, you know, the army told me you will be an MP. So I became an MP. Um, and then following being a platoon leader at Fort Riley, Kansas as well, uh, combat support platoon leader, I, I moved over into to Germany uh, and, and it been a combat support MP my entire career with one exception. Uh, right after I had uh, a baby, they put me over into the third MP group, which is a CID or criminal investigation um, division. And and so I did that little bit of law enforcement for about nine months. But other than that, I have been strictly uh, combat support MP all you know in all assignments, whether deployed or in Europe or or here, CONUS. Interesting. And when you did CID, was that uh, did you just move from one office to another at a particular post, or did you were you reassigned? No, altogether? that that that's a that's a good question. That uh, that worked out really well. I was my husband was at Fort Stewart, Georgia, as a operations officer in in armor battalion. Um, and I was able to go to Hunter army airfield, which is only about 20 miles away. So we lived Mm -hmm. in between. Um, and so they, they just, I was at Fort Stewart, Georgia. So then they said, Hey, we'll just reassign you to to CID. They are different commands. So it is an actual reassignment, but I didn't have to move or anything because it's just right down the road. Mm -hmm. So it worked out well. It really supported me as a, as a new mother, my husband deployed, uh, my, my daughter was 10 days old and my son was 13 months old. And my husband was deployed, and so they were. They allowed me, and I've been supported this way my entire career. Um, they put me in a job that really supported my family, especially while my husband was gone, mm-hmm. and, and that was much appreciated. Well, and and this is what I, I'm curious about: is we we worry a lot in the army for good reason about the impact of deployments on families. Um, I'm wondering your experience is especially complex because it's not a matter of of uh, a uh, one spouse being in the military and the other one being a civilian, but actually both of you being in the army and trying to manage the deployment of one of the two, uh, uh, one of the two members of the couple. Have you felt like your experience is typical of other uh, dual career families? And do you think, uh, do you have a sense of how different your experience has been from that of say com- uh, families where the one spouse is deployed and the other one is a civilian? I think that it's all very different. So I have mm-hmm. a few other dual military families at, at the same rank. Mm-hmm. They have had equally as challenging experiences, but very different. And it's just based off of their branch. I have been extremely lucky. The MP Corps is very good at integrating women. We've been doing it forever. The MP Corps is very, very supportive of women in all roles, and they have taken a, taken really good care of me. I would say my peers that, that are both dual military um, do not have as good of an experience as I have had, and mm. I've seen them struggle quite a bit. And I, I really you know, count my blessings when, when I look at the leaders that supported my family and my career and helped me make the best decisions for, for all of it. And then, you know, really just, just helped us out quite a bit. And I I would then go on to say the experience of the civilian, um, you know, married to an army officer who is who was deployed. I, I can't speak on that, but what mm-hmm. I can tell you is, um, my husband and I did not get married till nine and a half years ago or ten years ago. And the last deployment he was on, I was with a lot of other spouses, and these women had been married to their husbands for twenty years, and had basically been with them since you know nine eleven. Mm-hmm. And when I looked at how much they have gone through over this long career, you know, how much they are home alone with their children and trying to their their careers and whatever it is, I, I sometimes think that's way harder for them. You know, mm-hmm. I I get that support from from my unit from the army and these ladies, man, they've been doing it for twenty years and I don't know if I could do it. I really don't. Mm-hmm. You know, their kids are seventeen years old and their their father's been fighting a war, you know, all over, all over the war world. 
for the entire time. So I think they're all very challenging. I think they're all very different. And it's very hard to compare uh, between dual military couples just based off goals, um, career, you know, tracks, right. you know, who's deploying more. So it, it's interesting, but we do talk quite a bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm, in a, I'm, I'm in a bunch of little, you know, chat rooms with them and we're always sharing, you know, Hey, what do you do with this? How do we do that? Uh, what do you think of this place? Or is, is this guy a good, uh, a good, uh, leader and support dual military families? Cause there are mm-hmm. some people out there who do, do not support us. And would you say, and is that, a, that can be a function of the specific, uh, commander or the specific, uh, the po- specific post or the specific, uh, uh, place of, uh, place of assignment? I think it, 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 I don't, from working at a human resources command, I really got to see it firsthand of, of who gets supported and who doesn't. I think it is branch related and I think it is leader related. Mm-hmm. So that, and that's kind of what we talk about. Like, Hey, you know, this guy is not real supportive of, you know, maybe it's just women <laughs> and maybe it's dual military women or, you know, it, there's a whole, a whole bunch, but we, we do chat about it and we re- really do try to help each other. But I will say none of us have anywhere near the same experience um, and it ebbs and flows. Mm-hmm. So right now, John and I have been together for about two years, but prior to that, John was gone for almost four years straight. When my daughter turned four, he had only slept in the same house as her for 40 nights. Is that right? And mm-hmm. and this was, he was in, he was in Iraq and in Afghanistan? Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Korea and mm-hmm. Poland. Just everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I right. was lucky to stay home and my people really supported me and said, Hey, her husband's gone. We can't, those parent, those kids deserve to have a, a, a parent home. So we're not going to send Anne. And you know, while that mm-hmm. could hurt my career, sometimes it, it takes care of the family and that's what's really important. Do you, uh, and, and since, since you raised the question, I, I, I want to push a little bit on that is, is do you feel that the choices you've made, I mean, you have, you've made it to Lieutenant Colonel promotable and you were at the, at the war college. So from an outsider perspective, I'd say it, it uh, your career has, has chugged along very, very nicely, but have you felt as though there were moments where you had to make choices, uh, that, uh, that could potentially, uh, slow down your career or hurt your career? Oh, absolutely. And I was Mm -hmm. told specifically by by my branch when I made the choice, I was a pregnant major um, (laughs) and I was done with with what I had to do as a major, my KD time as a major. And my husband was going to Fort Stewart, Georgia. And the only job there for me was this kind of weird job. And they said, if you take that, you're ruining your career. You'll you'll never be a battalion (laughs) commander. And so I said, well, I I would like to live with my husband for the first time. I am pregnant, Um, (laughs) you know, and we had never lived together at this point. It had been three years. We've been married three years or something. And so I said, I'll do it. So, you know, and then I get a battalion command and, and okay. I hope, I hope, you, send, I hope you send whoever told you that you'd never have a battalion <laughs> command a, a card every Christmas or something. Well, to then this, the same thing happened though, coming out of battalion command. So they hmm. said, somebody told me that, well, you have to go joint. You got to go to DC if you want to be a brigade commander. You'll never make brigade commander, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, well, again, I, you know, my children, their father's been gone for four years. My children need to be with their father. So, and some people helped us to get to the same location at HRC. And then now I just was selected to be a brigade commander. So what I would tell people is <laughs> do what's right for you and your family, have fun, take care of people and work hard. And you know what? It'll all work out. What, uh, that's, that's great advice. Of course. Do you find that younger women officers seek you out for advice? They do, but I'm very, um, wary of it sometimes mm-hmm. because I, Ron, you know me a little bit. I'm very open and transparent. I'm, I'm not going to just say what they want to hear. So I will tell mm-hmm. them if you want my advice, I will tell you, but it's not all roses. This is a very hard life right? and you need to prepare yourself. And I have young lieutenants that come to me and they're, they're recently married and they, they, they're having babies and they're like, Oh, how did, how did you do it? Well, I didn't do it when I was a Lieutenant and a captain in, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq and whatever, I was single. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't have to worry about a husband and, and, a, and a family. I, so I don't know if I could have done that. I don't know if I would have made it to major at that point, trying to take care of all that at the same time. And just being young and inexperienced, you know, that, that makes a difference. Sure. Because you, so did, did you and your husband meet when you were uh, stationed in the same location or how, did, how, how does one, how does one meet and get married? When one's an <laughs> army officer. Well, it's very hard prior to this, yeah, you know, I, I it was very hard, especially, you know, as a single army officer everywhere. And I, I didn't get stationed at the greatest places for meeting people. <laughs> Fort Letterwood, Missouri, you know, it's not really happening. Um, <laughs> but, but I love Fort Leonard Wood. It's my favorite army post. The, um, uh, we met at the, the, at, 
at CGSC at, mm-hmm. at ILE at Fort Leavenworth. We okay. were both there as students. And, and so that one you would have been majors by that point? Yes, we were mm-hmm. we were junior majors, just junior just pinned major. Pinned major. Mm-hmm. And and now you're at the War College at the same time as mm-hmm. well. How's that how's that working out for the two of you? Uh, it's <laughs> We, I mean, it, I'm granted, granted, full disclosure, working. full disclosure, Anne is in my seminar at the War College, <laughs> so I should say that, but, uh, and, and, and her husband, uh, John is, uh, my advisee for his research project. So, um, uh, I've, I've heard some of this before, but, uh, so you, but you don't have to comment on the quality of the instruction, but I am curious what it's like to both be students at the same time. It, it's, it's really challenging, but we're figuring it out. I mean, and that's what we've always had to do, right? You know, we have to kind of figure out, um, our, our schedule, our path, we have to come up with systems to manage everything. I think if it wasn't in the middle of a pandemic, it would be fine. We would mm-hmm. be okay. The problems we have right now, you know, we have children at home that we are doing um, schoolwork for them. And so there is times where it's just impossible to do our own work because we have, you know, yesterday William had eight hours of work and, and he's seven. So he needs quite mm-hmm. a bit of help on it. Um, so with if the kids were in school Monday through Friday, we would be doing great. And I think we could handle it. And there'd be some, you know, consternation, but that's natural with anybody with two careers, military or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the the pandemic is making it extremely challenging. John and I are working through it. Obviously, we, we um, kind of upfront invested in me. And so I got majority of my research project done. I've already taken two electives. And the goal is now it's kind of his turn to... To he really needs to buckle down on his SRP, and I will take on more of the role of teaching the kids and stuff. So um, we, we're, we're figuring it out. It's just it's just a lot. Mm-hmm. But the good news is, because of the pandemic, we got nowhere to go. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> not a lot you, going on. So we're recording this uh, in January. So how did how did you handle holidays? Did you did you go anywhere? We did actually. So mm-hmm. we basically self quarantined for about two and a half weeks. And then we went to my family's house in Iowa and um, only hung out with them, just my mom and dad and my brother. Uh, and then we were there for a week and, and then we, we came back. And so um, felt we did that as, as safe as we could. And then my my family, there's like, they live like in a farm in Iowa. So mm. they are very safe to begin with, but they also did some extra precautions too to make sure that we didn't get sick while we were there. Mm-hmm. And so far we've been home now for over two weeks and no one's no one's come up sick. So that's good. And my, and my parents are relatively old. So we wanted to protect them from that perspective mm. too. So I, we've already touched on this a little bit, right? That it's it's hard to say what a typical army experience would be. So I won't ask you if your experiences have been typical, but um, but I am curious if you you know at, at what at what points did people tell you what you should expect, um, and did you find out that things were not the way that you expected them to be? Do you mean from my mentorship perspective? In your mentor, in, from mentorship perspective, I mean you know assuming that mentors are always doing the best they can. But um, what things have you discovered that were that people may have tried to give you advice, but they were they turned out to be different than you expected? That's a really good question. Um, I, I don't I don't really think I have an answer for that. Most of right. the advice I have gotten from mentors that have my best interests in mind have been pretty spot on, mm-hmm. and I have had some challenges and gone back to them and said, "Hey, I don't know what to do," and. They've really, instead of telling me what to expect or what to do, they have really just started the conversation to let me come to the conclusions of what to expect or what to do. So it's more on me. Mm -hmm. I will tell you the best mentorship I got, and the person shall shall remain nameless, (laughs) was after battalion command, I was sat down by a very senior general and who has always supported my husband and I. He was very clear. He said, you are now going to be a colonel and you're going to go to the war college. At this point, you may have to make some decisions. Your family has been able to be supported up till right now. But at this point, you know, we might need you to do something that is not in the best interest of your family. And you need to get mentally prepared to make hard decisions, be it get out of the army, be it you have to, you know, deploy away from your children for a year, whatever it might be. He was very, he wasn't threatening and he wasn't Mm -hmm. um, aggressive about it or doomsday about it, but he just wanted me to be aware that, you know, this could be coming around the corner and if you need help making these decisions, you can always call me. And I've called him two or three times. And and again, he doesn't tell me what to expect. He just says, okay, Ann. And it makes me talk through the kind of pros and cons and lets me come to my own conclusions. So I don't really think that I've ever had someone tell me something and it turned out different, except mm-hmm. for you'll never be a battalion commander. <laughs> <laughs> 
but that's a good kind of that's a good but those weren't mentors those were just you know like peers and stuff saying that you know you won't make it you you know you have to be this you have to be that Mm -hmm. i mean it, it, it is it is hard right that uh, as, as we keep saying it's hard to generalize um, and you you you've, you've painted a picture where army procedures while you know complicated because the army is army's a hard life but at least it's been possible for you to build a kind of the kind of life that you've wanted so far do you what if any uh, are there any policies or uh, let's say habits of behavior within the army that um, if you were in a position to give advice to senior leaders that they might want to consider uh, changing to make things easier for families? Yes, there are, there are things, <laughs> there's a lot of things, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, there's some childcare, you know, I, I think that we don't do, we do not do a good job at childcare in the military, but I think it's such a huge animal, you know, and it's really easy right. for me to say, hey, childcare needs to be better, but, but I've never been tasked to fix it. <laughs> so I, I think that that's, that's hard. The, the big, the big, um, the big thing though, and we th- talk about Mac Peer military, you know, um, mm. married army couples program is prior to this new push with the talent management task force, things were a lot harder, but as much as talent management task force has made things kind of weird, it actually helps to military couples. There's a, a few initiatives that they have taken, such as the ability to opt out of boards um, mm. that actually could help us. Cause you could, we, sometimes we need to change our year groups based on what's right. available to us. So there's a few things that have happened with TMTF that's made your career a little more choose your own adventure, which I think benefits dual military couples. And that is something that I would have, I would have said in the past mm. there just from a, a female perspective, well, let me go back. The other thing, sure. though, that so they're on the table right now. There's big discussions to cut the 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 BAH, which is our basic allowance for housing, to of dual military couples. So right now, my husband and I both get one. Where and everyone hmm. would say, well, they have one home. We do, but usually we don't. <laughs> We're separated <laughs> so, so much. Often, often you have not, right? Yeah. Yes, and it, it, it's a congressionally mandated benefit, so you really shouldn't cut it. That goes to the soldier, not the family. But um, the amount of money that it costs my husband and I, I mean, we spent forty five thousand dollars in childcare last just last year. Right. So it, it you know, there's there's some financial stuff that we could be helped with. But what my husband and I always say is that you know we all make decisions, and this is a decision that we have made, and we have decided to stay in, and therefore we need childcare. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We need help with that. Um, but as a woman, there are things that you know I, I would talk to people about. And I've had the opportunity recently to to talk to some senior people about when we talk about sexual harassment, sexual assault, uh, gender integration. And I find that, that interesting. Can I ask, how did, how did your life change? Uh, Or did you, did you notice that there was any change in the way that you were treated as a woman in the army between when you were a single woman officer and when you were a married woman officer? No. But so it mm-hmm. has always been the same. I am always underestimated when I walk into a room immediately. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. never changes. Mm-hmm. I always, when I speak, I have to be right. So it's funny. My husband always tells tell people, don't bet her because if she bets, that means she knows it. <laughs> like she does. I don't speak unless I'm right. I will never say I think or or mm-hmm. I will never take a guess at something because I have learned that I am already underestimated and I can't lose any more credibility than I already have from simply being a woman. Hmm. And that's, you can say, oh, that's crap and it shouldn't be that way. Well, it's a fact and it's a fact that I have to navigate around. So let's do it intelligently. So, you know, that, that's something that's always been the same. Uh, We have to, you know, prove ourselves in in all rooms. I'm used to it. I don't take offense. I think it's an unconscious bias. I don't think my peers and mentors and leaders out there are intentionally, you know, misogynistic, but I think that they, they can sometimes just for no reason than their own experiences and being mostly around men. Mm-hmm. they just do things naturally. Now, when my husband married me, he said he started to see it and he started to notice it. He would notice in meetings, I would say something be completely ignored and someone else would say the exact same thing. And all of a sudden it's, oh, that's a great idea. And he said, prior to that, I never saw it. And he said, I may have done it as well until mm-hmm. I married you and witnessed it. It, w- it was hard to, to see. So, you know, th- there's... It's also interesting, and we kind of bring it back to the sexual assault thing again, and even mm-hmm. Fort Hood. We make all these policies, but no one talks to us about it. And I know men get assaulted too, but when's we need, you know, when's the "Hey, how's this working out for you, ladies?" question mm-hmm. come? You know, and I, and I don't know if it does. That, that's a that's one of the 
one of the questions I definitely wanted us to to touch on in our last couple of minutes is we we talk about uh, how to how to integrate people into the force. We talk a lot about about standards. We talk a lot about what we expect of soldiers, but an awful lot of the pressure is placed on on women to show that they belong, quote unquote. But mm-hmm. what is it that you know? What what advice would you give to senior leaders? What do what do men need to know? I mean, you've already mentioned this idea that we need to be more aware of unconscious bias when we uh, when when there's a woman in a meeting. But what um, what should you know, what should people be taught or encouraged to think in order to improve uh, gender relations within the the military? And how should we measure improvement? Well, I don't think we can teach it at the mm-hmm. point of join in the military. That is something that is taught in the home and cultivated right. from a young age. Yeah. So, and there's, there's no way around that. And it's our culture. And again, that's why I don't take offense to that, especially because every male boss I've ever had has been exceptional to me and given me obviously all the opportunities, um, as, as a men. Right. So I, you know, I, I think that that's, that's hard, but I think we can, you know, talk more about the fact that it can be hard for us to say it. I had a, this is a good story, kind of. I had a young captain who got in trouble when I was a battalion commander and she was a company commander in, in my battalion. Mm-hmm. And she got in trouble and was uh, suspended and then she was put back into command. But before she was put back into command, the brigade commander wanted to talk to her. And I was sitting outside the door. I was not in there and I could hear him and he was just attacking her, just yelling at her, just berating her up, you know, up one side and down the other. And then she didn't say a word. And I was, I was thinking to myself, stick up for yourself, stick up for yourself. Um, she wouldn't. And then he got really mad. So then she left and he said to me, you know, she didn't even stick up for herself. Maybe I won't put her back in command. And I said, sir, she's not going to. She has spent her entire life just, yes, sir. She went to West Point, she did other stuff. She has learned it's not worth talking because you're not going to listen. You've mm-hmm. made up your mind about her and that is it. I said, she will never stick up for herself because of that. And that is true. And a lot of women do that. So I think that... Men need to understand that obviously we process things differently, mm-hmm. but that they have some sort of bias and that every, and this goes not just for women, but every soldier is different, you know, and, and until we really take the time to figure out what makes them tick or what buttons need to be pushed, you really can't lead them. Hmm. And so you can say it about women or just really anybody in general. So but that's, that's, that's really good advice for, for leadership going forward is to try to know the people under your command and know how to relate to them. Um, uh, one last question for you, and this is a really big question. At the beginning of the conversation, you said that you've essentially been trying to, you've been thinking about getting out of the army for as long as you've been in and here you've been in for 21 years. And these have been, these have been two very difficult decades for the United States armed forces, right? Your, your career expands, you know, or spans the entire period of the, the forever wars. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what advice would you give to someone right now, someone who was thinking about making a career in the army? How should they approach the prospect of a career in the army? Is it something you should always be, you should always be thinking about how you're going to get out even as you move forward? Or um, what sort of mindset would you want somebody to bring into the army if they were going to start a career? I would, well, obviously if they're going to start a career, they've, they've already, you know, committed to trying. And I think that's important. I think they need to take stock in what happens every day and then realize that the army is hard. It is physically hard. Mm-hmm. The army is a sacrifice. The army is, you know, it can be isolating and it can be maddening, but at the same time, it is the only job that I can think of <laughs> where I am happy more than I am not. And I had a conversation with my father when I was a senior captain and I was going to get out of the army and we went, mm-hmm. you know, I was single and I, you know, couldn't meet anybody. And my dad said, okay, so where are you going to go work? I said, I don't know, insurance company. He's used that as an example. He's like, so who are you going to meet there? You know, these aren't the type of people you want to be around. You like the people that are in the army. You like service oriented people. And then he asked me to for a month to keep track of good days and bad days at work. Mm-hmm. And then also keep track of days that I laughed at work. So even on bad days, sometimes you'll still laugh, right? So I could be right. a bad day, but it has a little L in the little corner of my calendar. And when I did it, I laughed every single day that month. And I think out of the 30 days, let's say there was like 25 days were good days. He, and then he's like, you know what? No civilian will ever say that. You know, my father worked at a large corporation his, his entire life and has hired, a, you know, a ton of people. And mm-hmm. he was like, they'll never be able to say that they've had that many good days and they've laughed every day and that they, they have a family and a community. So it really depends what you want to get out of your career. 
I would tell them to, to, to look very hard at the pros and cons. The pros are it's you laugh every day. You're in good shape. You have a family. You have job security. You know, the, the cons are you, you don't know what you're doing the next day. So if you can mm-hmm. handle, um, I don't know what the word is there, if you can handle the uncertainty of the military and the sacrifice and the, you know, having to give up seeing your family and maybe seeing, you know, and I mean extended family or, mm-hmm. or vacations or holidays or whatever it is. And you can deal with the fact that you could die. Then the army's the army's for you, and that sounds kind of abrupt. That's a big right? one but, at the end there, but I but I understand the point that you're. But making. it's a but the odds are you know technically slim, mm-hmm. um, and then we have a great army, so it, you have to pro and con it out. And the army's not for everyone. And I I have ushered a, quite a few officers out of the army hmm. in a very positive way because this this just isn't for you, and you'll be so much happier doing something else. And they are interesting. You know, you have to figure out what your number one priority is. I think, and for me, it was happiness. I just I liked. I know soldiers make me laugh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I love them. They, they crack me up and it's funny. I'll, I'll even get sick of like the constant grind of dealing with soldier stuff. And then as soon as I get a break from it, you know, you come out of command and two months later, I'm like, man, I miss, I miss the constant grind of dealing with soldier stuff because they make me laugh and they make you smile when you do something good for them or you pin a medal on their chest. It's, it's a pretty big day. Pretty big day. Well, uh, I, uh, I can imagine that the soldiers who've served with you and have enjoyed it. It's certainly been, a, it's been enjoyable to have you in seminar and it's been enjoyable to have you here for this conversation. Unfortunately, our time is up, but thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel Ann Meredith for joining us for this conversation on a better piece. Absolutely. I've, I enjoyed it. Thank you. You bet. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and all the programs. Send us your suggestions for future programs. Please subscribe to A Better Peace if you have not already. And why haven't you subscribed to A Better Peace? And after you subscribe, please rate and review this podcast on your podcatcher of choice so that other people can find us and participate in these conversations. We're always interested in hearing from you and we're interested in having you be part of our listening community. So uh, thank you for joining us for this conversation. And until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.com. Dot Army War College dot edu and have a great day.